Well, good afternoon and welcome to our Commemorative Air Force webinar series. I'm going to stall for just a minute since we need to start this exactly at three o'clock. So we'll wait for a couple people to come in before we get started. Each week, the Commemorative Air Force is bringing a new story to educate, inspire, and honor. And today our topic is Tora, 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 about the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941, and the mission of Tora Sponsor Group. The Tora Group uses a spectacular reenactment to tell the story of the event which led to the United States entry into World War II. With us today are two gentlemen who've been with Tora since the beginning of the CAF Tora story. They're Mike Burke and Buddy Cooksey, and two others who are integral to the act now, Patrick Hutchins and Craig Hutain. Mike, would you give us a brief description of your involvement with Tora? Presently, I'm the uh, core lead, which is the operations officer, uh, unit leader, and aircraft coordinator. I work with uh, Gordon Webb, our pyro person, to book the shows. We lead the shows. Uh, I set up the uh, the formations, uh, lead the training, and uh, it's it's pretty much a full time job. All right, thank you, Buddy. Would you give us a brief intro and tell us of your involvement? Well, like Mike, I was there from day one back in 1972 when. Uh, Tommy Reedy decided it was a good idea. He saw some old airplanes sitting on the ramp and the DAF really did not want them there. So that started the whole thing. He says, I think we can make an air show act out of that. So I've been involved ever since. First as a mechanic, then as a pilot. Excellent. And Patrick, how about you? Well, I'm a new guy. I'm only in my 17th year with the team, but I uh, I grew up watching my father fly tour. I think I was 16 years old when he started, and uh, so several years later, I was finally able to get involved and take his place, and I'm flying the airplane that he flew for all those years. What a great honor. And Craig, as the baby of the group, would you tell us your involvement, please? Yeah, uh, yeah, funny that uh, Patrick said that he's a new guy. Um, I remember going to see the movie Tora 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 uh, when it first came out in 1970, I think, 69 or 70, I think is when the movie came out. And I remember vividly seeing the uh, seeing the movie with my dad. I was 11 years old at the time. And, um, uh, you know, all these years later, uh, I'm flying in the group, flying with those airplanes in this group. I actually started uh, participating in the CAF around 2008, uh, helping out in the pyro field and uh, just volunteering. Um, I was a full-fledged member of TORA by 2010, um, and this will be my uh, 11th year. If we had a year this year, this would be my 11th year of flying with TORA. Excellent. Dreams do come true. And my name is Nancy McGee. I'm the Vice President of Education for the CAF, and I have the great honor of conducting these webinars. So we're gonna have a lot of fun today. Well, let's go ahead and get started. December 7th, 1941, the day that would live in infamy. Buddy, would you please give us a, a brief overview of the attack on Pearl Harbor? Sure. Uh, in fact, the uh, photo you have here, the iconic photo from that day of the USS Arizona, uh, that probably is the most, like I say, the iconic picture. What really caused all this? I mean, it's a long history that you could go back and get into weeds, but I'm going to keep it real short here. In 1895, approximately somewhere in that time, uh, Japan invaded China and they tried that for a while, they had some success, and then, okay, they pulled back. And in the 19, like 1904-05, they got into a war with Russia, and they soundly beat them, 
at Shishima. And uh, so with that kind of a background, the Japanese hierarchy kind of felt like they were probably could do about anything. So in 1931, they invaded Manchuria, set up a puppet government. 1937, they invaded China again. And at that time, the US, using the dip diplomacy side, was trying to keep them from going in there and doing that and tried to talk them out of it. Uh, the Japanese didn't really cooperate. So in April of 1940, uh, it looked like war might be inevitable. So President Roosevelt sent the battle fleet to Hawaii, which was a bunch of old battleships mainly and a couple of carriers, cruisers, stuff like that. And uh, things kept deteriorating. And in, well, actually before that, in July of 1940, he put the Export Control Act into effect, which meant that uh, the things that we've been selling to Japan, oil, uh, Swift iron, all that kind of stuff was cut off to them. And being as they're a small country with an increasing population, no natural resources to speak of, they had to do something. So they decided to create what they call the Greater East Asia Code Prosperity. And we're going to bring everybody together. Well, knowing that and more trouble between the two countries, uh, the army. Japanese Army directed the Japanese Navy to do something to make sure that they could continue their conquest. Admiral Yamamoto, who had been a diplomat here in the United States, understood our country, said it's not a good idea. They said do it anyway. So he started planning. He brought in an air um, genius named Jenda. So to plan the attack, they figured it all out. Sunday morning would be the best and things like that. So they started practicing for it. And then a gentleman by the name of Fushida, he was a commander and he led the entire attack that morning. After the war, he became an evangelist and uh, <laughs> passed away in 1976. And to bring it around to the attack itself, strangely enough, the United States fired the first shot and had the first victory that day. And as much as the USS Ward sank a Japanese submarine that was trying to get into the harbor. So we actually made the sh first shots at the first victory, so to speak. We also had airplanes, the flight of East 17s coming in from the West Coast, and they were due to arrive about the same time the, of course they didn't know they was gonna arrive at the same time the attack was going on. And uh, so they were coming in and it's crazy enough, another one of those coincidences, we had a radar site set up at Opana Point. They picked up the incoming Japanese fleet, but when re they reported it, they thought it was the B-17s coming in, so nothing was done. The attack was a total surprise, worked out, perfectly for the Japanese. It was uh, successful in every way as far as a tactical. Strategically, it was terrible because they left all our oil supplies untouched, our submarines untouched, most of the smaller vessels untouched, and by the grace of God, we had no aircraft carriers there. So the ships that were sunk and damaged, yeah, they were valuable ships, but they were not the front line. Into this whole program, uh, the United States lost 2,403 uh, soldiers, sailors, and airmen killed, 1,178 wounded, and the Japanese lost 29 airplanes, five submarines, with the loss of less than 100 personnel. And that's real short to the point. Now, there's a whole lot I could tell you, but let's keep it short. That was amazing anyway. because I know there's over a thousand books, thousands of books that have been written about that. You could spend an entire college semester just on the attack itself. So thanks for the very concise but informative 
history lesson because just in case our audience isn't well versed in their Pearl Harbor history, I want to make sure that they had a background before we talk about our next step. So we're going to fast forward. We know how the war ended. We're going to fast forward to 1970 when the blockbuster movie Tora 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 came out and created a renewed interest in the attack on Pearl Harbor. You know, Tora Tora Tora, was, that was back when Hollywood blockbuster movies brought in many of the leading people of the time, the, the most famous actors to be involved in these epic movies and, and Tora was one of them. So Mike, can you tell me what sort of impact the movie had on the CAF? Well, the CAF is a very patriotic organization, and everybody went to see the movie. Uh, they they, they uh, enjoyed the movie. It brought back <clears throat> brought back the history of the war, which really wasn't being taught a lot then. And it, it also recognized all these World War II airplanes that no one was uh, uh, keeping around, saving for future generations to see. So it kind of reinvigorated the warbird industry and uh, the movie industry. And all the, all the patriotic uh, veterans, they love it. Uh, it's a it's a flying history lesson, and uh, we we enjoy doing it. And uh, after the war, after the picture, you know, the airplanes were sold, and was uh, and a doctor in uh, Memphis bought six of them and donated them to the CAF, and that's how they first uh, came to the CAF. Excellent. Well. That is how we came to get the aircraft. So tell us, um, Mike and Buddy, a little bit about those aircraft. The, uh, the Zero made out of T6s. Uh, the uh, Kates were made out of SNJs and VALs, and the VALs were made out of Volte BT-13s. And most of the aircraft were built by Cal Aero Sport in Chino, California. And the number of airplanes that were built changes we can't get a, a really a good fleet number but somewhere around 35 airplanes were built the movie industry nowadays could not uh, afford to do what they did because they took each airplane modified it returned it to flight status and every airplane in the movie actually took off from the aircraft carrier for a movie scene go ahead buddy no that's it you're you're right on on target there uh, the uh Strangely enough, the valves were probably the most accurate reproductions. The uh, Kates, during the attack itself, had multiple functions. They were used as torpedo bombers. They also attached some uh, uh, armor-piercing bombs to them and came in with what they referred to as horizontal bombers and dropped them from 10,000 feet. So. Our tapes are pretty accurate as far as reproductions, even though that their basic center sections are T6 slash session J aircraft. Um, they were sitting down in Harlingen, the Kate and the Val were kind of immaculate. Someone had taken them and cleaned them up, painted them. They were really gorgeous airplanes. The, <clears throat> the uh, Zeros, they still had the Hollywood paint on it, and they were kind of looking a little ratty at the time. So uh, I think we're, that's where Mike and I learned all about paint stripping and repainting and stuff like that back in the day. Excellent. That Thanks, right, Mike. That's correct. Character building stuff. All right. So Patrick, would you talk about the use of each of these aircraft? We're talking about Zeros, Kates, and Valves. So tell us about those, please. Well, the Zeros were basically the fighters. And uh, we gave them the name Zeke because the American fighter pilots, they wanted a nickname the Japanese airplanes. And so we called the uh, fighters, we named those after uh, men or males so zeke oscar uh we named all the bombers out of after ladies names so the kate torpedo bomber was a bomber so it got the name kate k-a-t-e and uh the dive bombers which are vowels we 
Val, short for Valerie, but so there were those three types, the Zeros, the Kates, and the Vows. So you had a fighter, a torpedo bomber for sinking ships, and a dive bomber for whatever it was used for. That was the, that was the three main ones. The Japanese uh, had lots of other aircraft, but these were the three main aircraft used in the attack on Pearl Harbor. There's a shot of Kates with their All torpedoes right. on the belly. All right, there we go. And then the valves. Yes, and Oops. these these are pictures from when they were making the movie. There's uh, only maybe three of those valves left flying in the world that I know of, and uh, I don't know, maybe five or six Kates, and uh, about that about that many uh, replica zeros. So there are no uh, anybody can correct me if I'm wrong here. There's about three real zeros flying in the world. And I don't think there's any real Kates in flying condition or any real vowels. Anyone else on the panel know you're, differently? You're correct. Okay. So something else that's interesting about the, the naming of the airplanes is the syllables as well. Like a Betty bomber is two syllables. So it's a girl, so it's a bomber, and it's two syllables, which means it's two engines. Uh, the Zeke was a single engine uh, male, so it would, would be a fighter, and the Kate and the Val would be single engine bombers. So it was not only just the, the, the gender of the names, but actually the syllables as well. Kind of cool. All right. So Patrick, when we were talking earlier, you discussed the modifications that were done by 21st Century Fox for the movie. So would you speak to this image, please? Sure, so in the top image is a stock T6, North American T6 trainer, which was the advanced trainer before you went on to fly a Mustang or a Corsair. In the bottom is the modification. So the, the biggest modification is the canopy, the teardrop shape of the, the zero canopy. Hard to see in this picture, but the wings on the bottom aircraft are about almost five feet uh, wider on the wingspan because it has rounded wingtips. They bolted on the rounded wingtips to look like a real zero. They put a little stinger on the bottom of the rudder on the back of the aircraft because Japanese had that little point. Uh, there's some fake cow flaps and then there's a gun deck in front of the windshield that uh, you can see. I guess it depends on how big of a screen our audience is looking at. So. And a, and a spinner on the propeller and then the gear, uh, they, have, they have gear doors on them, uh, like a real zero. So that's just a picture to basically show what they took to make the airplanes uh, look like Japanese aircraft out of. Now the CAF had these aircraft donated to them and, and Buddy, you, you and, and Mike got to do some elbow grease and some character building type activities to get the planes in shape. So um, how did the first Torah Air Show Act come to be? Well, um, to make a long story short, another long, one of these long story short deals, uh, we went down to Harlingen to help the CAF get ready for their first really big event, which was called Transportation Exposition 1972, which was, uh, <clears throat> they flew a number of our CAF aircraft over Washington, D.C. for the opening of uh, the uh, new airport, Dallas Airport. So a bunch of us went down there, J.K. West, Tommy Reedy, and some others, Went down there to help them prep the airplanes, get them ready to go to Transpo. Tommy Reedy noticed the uh, airplane sitting out on the ramp, asked around, and basically they said, man, if you can come up with some idea, try to get rid of them off the ramp. Uh, they kind of clutter our ramp. And the CAF was really kind of stuck at that time for authenticity in their aircraft. So. Tom Reedy made the comment, he says, I think we can make an air show act out of these things. So um, he checked out in the T-6 and flew one of the zeros home. In fact, it's the one that um, went 11 that is now 
Patrick, that's one you're flying. So that was the first one that came up to uh, Hamilton. And Tom Reedy kind of sat down, thought about it pretty hard, and came up with a game plan to utilize all these airplanes in an air show act. And even though we've modified it over the years and there's a lot of changes been made over the years, the same basic concept is still there to put as many airplanes as possible in front of the crowd with a whole lot of activity, bombs and all that sort of stuff. And uh, that's kind of how it came together. And again, Tommy Reedy was the guy that thought it up, grew it up, and uh, it was first used in Galveston, 1972. And there's a story there so I want to get into one of these days. Okay, well, let's get into that story. So that's my next question. For the first air show, did everything go according to plan? Almost. Being as that time, none of those Japanese airplanes had radios in them. And the deal was we would always stage those aircraft at a different airport that was nearby so that it would be a total surprise as it was at Pearl Harbor when they showed up. And uh, so they were based at a little airport called Spaceland, about 20 miles from the airport, from Galveston. And during the pilot briefing and stuff, they were told to uh, hit the airport at around, I think they said be there at 1210 so that they could get through the Star Spangled Banner, the introductions and all that. Typical of all air shows, introductions and the Star Spangled Banner and all that was a little bit late, but the airplanes hit the field on time. The uh, pyro person running the pyro at the time, he jumped right on, started firing the bombs off, and it kind of stunned everybody while the Star Spangled Banner is still going on, all these bombs are going off and airplanes are buzzing around. And it was quite interesting. And the announcer picked up what was going on and he kind of, you know, he really did a good job of <laughs> surprised as he was too. That what, because no one, even the, none of the people there had ever seen us practice it had no idea what it was gonna look like until those airplanes hit that day. It was a surprise to everybody, including all the CAF pilots. And it was totally effective. And what made it even better was at the end of that, the airplanes kind of just faded out back over the beach quietly. And there was a stunned silence for about three or four minutes at that air show before people started realizing, hey, this was this was pretty cool. And that was the first one. But the funny part was they got there in the middle of the Star Spangled Banner, which is basically what happened at Pearl Harbor on December the 7th. They hit just about the same time when flags were being raised. How appropriate. I guess it's a good thing there wasn't social media back then. I wonder, did anybody call police and were they worried they were truly under attack? Oh, I'm sure they did. I mean, it, it, like I say, it, it surprised everybody. They had no idea this was coming. And you can look around at the CAF pilots and the old guys been there, old guys compared to us, we were still kids. They were all looking around totally stunned. They didn't know what was going on. So it, that's what made it really great. I mean, only a few of us knew and had seen the practice sessions. And so how about you, Mike? And that's about the way you remember it too? Oh, absolutely. My first job, I was the tail gunner on the Cape that uh, I forgot who was flying it, maybe Joe Algrani. And uh, I, I wasn't married very long and my wife at the time didn't appreciate what I was doing. But, you know, no one knew about it. They, they had sheer chaos. But when it was all over, you know, we all shook hands. We all had a great time. And people, so, I mean, they started applauding. And, you know, it was going to happen tomorrow. But uh, one of the funny things was when we came back to the airport later, the FAA came up to me and said, were you strapped in that airplane? I said, yes, sir, I was. I was standing up in the back of that airplane. because it's got a deep floor working the machine gun. I didn't know any better, you know, but... 
we were paying our dues, you know, and then uh, uh, that's how Buddy and I worked our way up. Nice. What a great debut. It was fun. Well, has the show evolved since 1972? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, we've had more planes added. Some have left for different reasons. Uh, but, uh, you know, from the original aspect of putting as many airplanes as possible in front of the crowd, uh, yeah, it evolved in a lot of different ways. Uh, and with each Torah leader that came in, had different ideas how they think it ought to be done. And but and there's been some changes, like the initial attacks and stuff like that. There's some there's some modifications. Uh, the the inclusion of the B-17 during the act, whenever the B-17 and the Torah act are in the same location, uh, that that came part of the deal. And uh, so yeah, that was quite a bit of. Uh, when you, I mean, like say, whoever the current Torah leader was, he made changes that he felt were necessary. When Charles Hutchins was the unit leader, he liked for the airplanes to come in in waves of three. And that, that was fine. Um, but the break out of that, and, you know, we had it for a while there to where all the airplanes showed up at the same time. and. You know, it was all chaotic. I mean, it was a surprise attack. Now we do the overhead approach, which a lot of people seem to like real well. So, yeah, it's evolved. There's been a lot to it, and uh, adding of more case and more valves or less case, whatever we do, it's 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 constantly evolving. And it, well, well look at look look at uh, uh, Craig Houtain behind you, behind his or in front of his aircraft. Uh, we've included that now as a Curtis P-36 to make sure we have an adversary at every air show. He goes with them as the adversary or the Americans rising to defend the harbor. Yeah, that's Indeed. kind of true. So for the, uh, in the, in the short time that I've been with the group, uh, like Buddy says, it's, it's changed a, at least a little bit every year. And some years it's, it changes relatively dramatically, and um, I'm fortunate enough. We took uh, one of the one of the zeros that was in the group, and gave it a, a whole new identity. And now the identity of of, uh, of of zero one eighteen is now Hawk eighteen. It's a P thirty six replica, and so essentially we have the ability to bring uh, one American fighter that's very performance matched to the to to every show. So. That kind of adds a, a, a different level of, of interest and whatnot um, to the show. It, we typically, we'll bring uh, seven Japanese aircraft replicas and 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 the Hawk one and Hawk one eight, and then uh, so that's our typical complement is eight uh, aircraft, and I get to be the I get to be the the good guy, if you will. But really, it's just it's just a, a, such an honor to do this show. And the fact that I get to, uh, you know, actually be the, the unique airplane in the group is, is pretty neat. And I'm very grateful for that. Excellent. For years, for years and years, we would use the P-40 or we would use the Wildcat. And as they got more expensive to operate, uh, they're really expensive to operate. And to, you have to come to a, a, a practice every year. It's mandated by the FAA and getting people that can go all the time. And so we, we talked about this for Craig, uh, four or five years, and we need to get our own fighter. We need to get our own fighter. Well, Craig Hutain, myself, Bobby Covington, and uh, Doug Durr, in 10 days, transformed that airplane to a fighter. And it was a, it was a hit from the beginning, and the airplanes are really close, matched in performance. So Craig can stay right with Dan Reedy, which is our dog fighter. Everybody is specialized, and everybody loves it. And what's great is, after, after tour is over, we come by, we do a wall of fire, and then we do a, a photo pass. And while we're doing that, Craig uh, climbs up, and here's the victor doing victory rolls. Very appropriate for him to do the victory rolls. And the crowd, they're jumping up and down and cheering for him. I got chills right now, cheering for him. You know, and people really, really loved it. Uh, and so it's all evolved. We've made it a little bit safer. Uh, we have um, a lot more detail in our attack. 
and uh, uh, all our pilots are, are, are top-notch pilots. And when a man wants to be a pilot Torah, from the time he walks up, and Craig can tell you, Patrick, from the time you walk up, it's two years before you get to fly in the show. That's how particular in the training, required training, it is to do the show at, at the performance level we're doing it now. Wow, thank you. Uh, you know, I've had the great pleasure of seeing the show and it is really something. So we're gonna get into the components of the show and what makes it so great and some of the training you're doing. But Craig, can you give us just a brief overview? We talked about the show has three integral components. So what are those, Craig? Yeah, uh, great question. Uh, we always say that the, the tour is not just about the planes or the pilots. It's uh, the planes and the pilots are one phase of it. Um, narration is absolutely um, an integral component of our show because without the message that the narrator is able to, to uh, put across to the audience, um, it's just a bunch of guys flying around in circles. And of course, the pyro is the real dramatic effect. So the three, the three facets of our show are planes and pilots, narration, and, uh, and pyrotechnics. Um, and I, I, th I think it's kind of interesting that we've, we've done some shows before, and I think we actually even discussed, I may be jumping ahead a little bit, and I apologize, apologize if I am, but um, maybe people don't understand what, the, what the, 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 the message of our show is. It looks like a bunch of Japanese uh, planes coming in and, and kicking our butts at Pearl Harbor, which is what Pearl Harbor was. That's historically accurate. Um, however, we do not we not glorify the the uh, the battle or on either side. We don't glorify war, et cetera, et cetera. The the narration is so integral to our show that if somebody has an issue with um, with our show, almost invariably you can you can guess that he did not listen to the narration. That's always my first question to him: Did you listen to the narration? Because uh, when people come up to me, I say, go near a speaker, go go towards the center of the audience. Go find a speaker and let and, and have your kids listen to it because it's a very powerful uh, deal. Now, the pyro speaks for itself. It's it's really cool and there's lots of bombs and bolts. Kids love that because you know what red-blooded American kids not a little bit of a pyromaniac. But uh, and of course the airplanes are are, are 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 what they are. They're lots of fun and everything else. But narration is probably the most important facet. We won't we won't actually do our show without all three of those those facets. So we may not use our own people all the time, um, just due to the nature of logistics and whatnot. But our show is, uh, is, is best when we have our pyro people, our narrator, and of course, uh, our pirates, our pilots, excuse me. All right, thanks. Well, let's talk about those components. So the first component, aircraft and pilots. Um, tell us what's what's the deal with those, and what sort of training goes into having a pilot perform? You mentioned a little bit about that, Mike, but so tell us what it's like to be a pilot, and what what the important factors are in this. Important factors, first of all, is safety, and and um, every one of our pilots, you have to have discipline, you have to have safety, you have to respect each other, and everybody communicates. Uh, we have uh, a very stringent uh, package. Uh, uh, Patrick and Craig are, have gone through it recently. We have uh, you have to have a formation card. You have to have a commercial license, second class medical. Uh, so you have to have over a hundred hours in a T6 or a thousand hours of total time. And there's a lots lots of requirements. And everybody, we have a board of directors, and we have a new guy come in. We discuss it, and. Uh, we have 12, 12 members on, on our board. If one man has a descending vote, then, then the gentleman's not, uh, not, not asked to join. We, we haven't had but one or two of those or over 50 years. And so we have a very close knit group. And uh, uh, Patrick, I'm uh, tour lead. Patrick's number two. He's always number two. He, he's, uh, he's the uh, uh, backup lead. If I have a problem, all I have to do is say leads out and no, no one talks. Patrick takes over, and the act goes on. And we practice that uh, engine out. We practice uh, a problem, and it's all very, very professional. We like to have fun and hoot and holler, but when we get in those airplanes, we're, it's all business, and uh, there's no kidding around. And because what we do is a fun thing, but you have from eight to fourteen airplanes in a quarter square mile. Everybody knows where they need to be, 
and uh, we have uh, barriers on the ground, and Patrick probably very well qualified. He's helped put those out. Yeah, and uh, when I think about being a Torah pilot, uh, I think there's 15 qualified Torah pilots. There's only one Torah, Torah, Torah air show demonstration in the, in the world. It's going to enter its 50th year this next year. So to be a Torah pilot is a, a privilege and an honor to be part of the longest running civilian air show demonstration team that anybody knows of. In addition to that, it's when we travel cross country, we land at little airports. We, we come over a little town, we all land to get gas. Half the town comes out, they take pictures, they have questions. Getting there is half the fun. And then when we arrive at an Air Force base or a civilian airport for an air show, we're greeted and taken care of and they give us cars and hotel rooms and, and, and we meet some of the most interesting people. And we've, in my 17 years with the team, I've got to meet countless veterans that have served in all the wars and we get to thank them for their service and we get to hear some of their stories. And, you know, our World War II veterans are, are going away, not gonna be with us much longer. So I'm glad that I got to enjoy uh, all the time I have of meeting those guys. And so that's my favorite part about flying with Torah. It's good to be the king, all right. So what about some of the pilots that have flown in in this act? Wow. There's about 80. How many did you say? There's about 80 in our uh, History of the Torah Gang book o over the 49. Some of them might have only flown for two months and that scared them and they went away or they flew a couple of years and went on to something else. But there's been around 80 people fly the air shows with Torah over the years. But go I ahead. Think, uh, in the early days, I mean, you know, when, uh, we had a number of NASA astronauts fly with us. Uh, Joe Engel and Deke Slayton, um, Joe Algrante, he was chief pilot for the uh, for NASA. Ed Mendenhall, most of all of these guys were outstanding pilots with great knowledge of aviation and uh they were always very humble very willing to work with us talk to us about what they thought was good bad, or indifferent uh we had sandy sensing a world war ii p-51 pilot a uh, great individual one of the best that we ever knew don't you agree with that mike absolutely uh, ron eiberg another outstanding pilot that taught us a lot so yeah we've had some really great people join up with us and fly with us from time to time and move on uh mike's dad flew tore a couple of times in the show he also flew it as a b-17 co-pilot uh, so you know we've had some really cool people over the years and right now we i think we fly with about the coolest bunch of folks we've ever had together I, I, totally agree. I totally agree with you, buddy. And I mean, we have sitting here right now, we have two uh, second generation pilots. Dan Reedy is a second generation pilot. So, you know, those us three uh, were kind of a novelty. You know, some of us, Buddy and I have been there almost, almost 50 years. Uh, Patrick came in and Dan came in almost the same year. And uh, uh, Patrick's flying the lead airplane. Dan, a few years ago, finally got to fly the airplane that his dad started being lead Torah, Dan flies 0114. And uh, I mean, you know, we're we're dedicated. We, we love what we do. It's, uh, I say, it's like Greg said, it's a living history lesson and it's uh, patriotic and uh, we have a lot of fun doing it. And it's a lot of work, but it's a, you know, a, a work of love. So we all love what we're doing. Nice. Now, what about the interactions that you have with the audience uh, at air shows? What is that like? Well, we are, uh, you know, the the air show that hired us to come there. Well, 
we we have to and we enjoy going and interacting with the crowd we have autograph cards we sign out the kids love it we get to ask them what they liked about the show and most of them like the bombs like craig said but we can walk down the crowd line sometime they'll sit us down at an autograph table and it's just uh they want to meet the guys that they just saw you know basically blow up the field so it's it's very interesting and it's and it's something that we need to do as a uh, you know as somebody that the air shows hired we want to be invited back we just can't put our airplanes away and go to the hotel and it's not that we're obligated to do this we enjoy it it's fun talking to the people and so it's a just another part of it kind of an interesting note along those lines um one of the things I really like to do, and I've, I've done it ever since I've been with Tora, is um, is grab little kids and throw them in the cockpit and let them sit there. And, and it's a lot of fun. It's really fun for them. But what happens invariably, if there's a large audience like at Wings Over Houston, we have a, just a, a multitude of, of uh, people that are able to walk around the hot ramp area. Um, you let one kid get in the airplane and a line forms and the line will never end. Um, it will, the line will continually get bigger and bigger and bigger until it's time to go to, to briefing or to fly the show and everybody's got to get booted out. But if you've got, if you've got the time, you've got the enthusiasm it, that the line will never quit. And every time, you know, two kids at a time, get up in the airplane, look around. Okay. How do you like it? And then boom, off you go. And sure enough, there'll be another kid or two behind them. So, um, it's a lot of work but you do see some really great smiles and that, uh, that makes that makes for a neat experience for us as well absolutely and you never know what sort of impact that has in the life of a child and who knows you may have just created one of the future torah pilots because of that absolutely okay so um any particular stories you want to tell about the airplanes or the pilots themselves. I know Buddy, you and I were talking about how uh, the audience will recognize this name. Fred Hayes was one of the first BAL pilots and he was an astronaut, is an astronaut uh, that was probably best known from the movie Apollo 13 because Fred Hayes was portrayed in that. Um, so anything that you can think of that you want to share with our audience about just planes and pilots? Sure, uh, Fred of course was the one that actually developed what we refer to as the VAL Act, the dive bombing part of it. And the thing about the NASA astronauts, that when they were, they were had so much enthusiasm for what this was all about. And yeah, they, they flew the world's greatest and best equipment in the whole world, but they loved getting in these airplanes. And, you know, as one would say, they're more challenging because you never knew what was not going to work. So they were they were really good about stuff like that. They were fantastic. They were willing to give you a lot of information. Another uh, deal was Van Skiles. Uh, he was a Trans Texas Airlines, and then later on went on up the scale to, and he was our B-17 pilot originally. And later on, he invited me to join up on that side of the deal. So. I get to fly the B-17 during the air show act whenever they're together, and I think that's a lot of fun. Uh, it kind of rip. during World War II, the Marines, finest gentleman you'd ever want to meet, just the nicest individual, but he could fly. He was great. So am I, am I, I, could, I guess we could talk for hours on all the good people that we've had come on board. And what, what did you say, Patrick, how many do we have now in the uh, um, maneuvers package? I think there's about 15 uh, people maybe maybe 16 i haven't yeah. looked at it lately but you know like uh 
Mike mentioned earlier today that you you will spend two years minimum, if not more, before you're in a seat to fly one of these airplanes during the show itself. I've got, I've got a story about Buddy. Um, we were at Temple, Texas. I was flying a Mustang. Buddy was in the B-17, so I was protecting him. And we, uh, unlike uh, uh, Air Force pilots, we fly close enough to see each other. And he looked at me, I was on his wing, and he said, you know, young man, he called me young man. I, you know, I'm a little bit younger than him. He said, we've come a long way. I said, we sure have. Well, the next day, I was leading Tora. I was up there trying to shoot him down. Oh, well, he wasn't so nice the next day. So, <laughs> but we, we always go by, you know, we, we uh, make gestures toward each other, but just stuff like that, where right in the middle of the whole melee, you might have a few comments, but when we, when we put the show on, everyone is so well-trained, there's very few things uh, spoken. Uh, we take off and I'll ask the air boss for a five minute warning. He gives it, I give back a three minute warning. We're over the field at three minutes and we'll go break. And if we do the whole, the whole thing, the next thing is said by anybody is pyro lead. He goes, you're out of bombs and bullets. So we break it off, we go, and within three minutes, all eight airplanes counting the fighter are joined back up to come back around for a wall of fire pass and then a photo pass. And then uh, uh, air boss says clear land. And I'll say tours on the left down wind. And that's all that's ever said. We leave, we leave it quiet in case anyone has an emergency, they don't have to wait for somebody else to talk. You have the field, we practice that, and ev everybody in the tour group knows where everybody's at all the time in that act. That's the level of uh, uh, experience we have flying today. As long as we're talking, telling stories about Buddy, I've got a cute one too, um, right. that I think is uh, uh, a, a lot of fun. Um, when he flies, uh, it, it's it's the person that's that's actually rated to fly with with uh, with the Torah Act, not the aircraft that that person is flying. So, Buddy flies the CAF uh, uh, Texas Raiders airplane ninety nine percent of the time, but occasionally when we have a air show someplace else, Buddy will be required to be in the airplane of the EAA's airplane or the uh, the the, uh, the Phoenix Wings air, air, airplane, wherever the B seventeen happens to be for logistical purposes, but we have to have our guy in that airplane, our guy is Buddy. So quite often, Buddy will be flying with guys that have never experienced the tour show. And invariably, um, they all uh, end up being a little bit surprised, maybe doing some screaming. And uh, that's all part of the act. And that's part of the fun of it because they really don't, you really don't get the the idea of what happens in the airplanes unless you're in the airplane and so where people get on the airplane and have a little bit of swagger and maybe might be a little bit miffed about having buddy fly their airplane in the show ultimately it's a really good idea because they probably couldn't have done it in the first place <laughs> All right. buddy. well let's talk about yeah. pyro what's Okay, I've seen the show. It's fabulous, but there's got to be a lot to the pyro. So explain how you guys pull that off safely. Well, if I may, so way back before I started flying with Tora, a lot of air shows would organize who was going to do their pyro. And so a lot of different pyro teams would shoot for Tora. And I believe some time back, my father, when he was tour lead, he asked a gentleman named Bob West from Bellevue, Nebraska, yeah, that he was he was doing some pyro. Would he head it up? Would he take care of it? And tour could have its own bomb squad, people that we could trust, people that we could travel with. And so that developed over the years into about 60 people that live from coast to coast that are part of the Tora bomb squad. So if we're doing a show on the East Coast, we can bring people in from Arizona and that part of the country. And if we're on the East Coast, there's people that live that way. And and uh, so more uh, working pyro is a lot of fun. I used to do it before I was flying. You get up early, you get home late, you're dirty, you have soot all over your clothes. 
but you had a good time and you had the best seat in the house because you're directly underneath the airplanes. So there's a picture of just one show. Um, there's, there's 10 to 15 people that we airline in, some of them drive in if we're doing a show close to their house. These are some very dedicated individuals and they love what they do and they're, they're good at it because it's, we have to trust them. They have to trust us. Um, we have to trust them that they're not going to set one of those charges off right in front of our airplane and they have to trust us that we're not going to fly too low or come sliding an airplane into their pyro field. But, um, because of that going on for so long, I think Bob West did it for some 20 something years. He passed away, has passed it on to Gordon Webb, which Gordon is Tora Pyro lead now. And he, he picks these people who's going to the show, uh, gets their availability and it all comes together. And once we get to a show, we're all a big family because you got eight pilots, you got 10 to 15 Torah guys, you got our announcer, and we're a, we're a big presence when we show up. Obviously, no, this is, this can't be just a group of guys running around a field with a lit cigar, firing off firecrackers. What sort of training goes on in doing the pyro? Well, there's several levels of, we have SICs. Some of these people have, uh, gain their shooter in charge, which is a lot to do with the ICAS Air Show Foundation, uh, the ATF. They all carry licenses and uh, they all have a lot of experience only gained from doing air shows. They start at the bottom where they might just be carrying a bag of gasoline all the way up to rigging debt cord and blasting caps, and, and they, they learn and they learn and they get better. Gordon is responsible for knowing the experience level of each team member so he can put them in the role that they can best be used at when we're at a show. And that's because of his years with the team. And this picture here, we usually get some volunteers to help because <clears throat> like Craig said, we all grow up with a little pyromania in us. Uh, so you, you might see some people in a, in a military uniform here, some other people that don't have the red or yellow shirts on. They, we will invite some people from the air show site to come out and help out if they would like to. Awesome. Mike, what ensures successful coordination between the aircraft and the pyro? Every time we have a, uh, Gordon and I, since uh, we, we do the booking and the contracts, we talk, I guarantee, and Patrick three or four times a week. I'm in Patrick's office two or three times a week on, on the finances and such as that. But the pyro people, they're, they're, they, they know when they're supposed to shoot, they know how much they are, and uh, when we have our briefing, Gordon comes to our briefing and he lays it out. He lays out where the pyro is. Craig is our tarp, we call him the tarp czar. We have, tarps that are on the ground that mark the beginning and ending of each pattern. And they're, uh, we have a 500 foot line, a 750 foot line, a thousand foot line. And so with, with Gordon there, Gordon's gonna say, okay, this pyro is between these tarps. Craig said the tarps start here, they end there. So when, when we come over the field, we're two flights of four, I look down and I'll say, I may say, got the tarps. And, uh, but Craig will have a, a map of the airport and he'll draw on there where where the uh all the uh, uh mats are where we're going to uh, fly over and so everyone knows about it looks at it because we're all very experienced we've been to airports we know where the runways are we know which runway we're going to operate on so we're all very well briefed and we have a i mean like patrick said you know we have a very good uh, relationship with the pyro people and he's also said we're like a family. Well, one night at the air show, all 30 of us get together and go out and have dinner. We all sit at the same table. And it's a, that's a, sometimes he coordinates it, sometimes Craig does, sometimes I do. And uh, it, it's, it's a big deal, but we spend three or four hours. And uh, at the end of the day, when it's all over, we'll all meet at the pool and maybe have a cocktail together. But it's, uh, it's like everybody said, 
it's, it's a big family. It's a close family. And uh, it's an honor to be part of it. And, it. and as far as I'm concerned, this is my fourth year's lead. It's a great honor to be the lead. And because these are great guys. And you, you have to trust the guy on your wing. He's 15 feet away from you. And, and uh, we're all, we all trust each other. I never have to look over at Patrick. I know where he's at. Uh, during the dog fight, uh, Dan never has to worry about where, where Craig is. He knows he's right behind him. Uh, the discipline is incredible that, uh, that, that we have for this act. That's why we have such a good act. And that's why we're very well respected uh, uh, throughout the United States. And to Mike's point as well, um, the physical uh, requirements of each show change. The, the, air, the airport's different, uh, the uh, spectator area is different and everything else. So when Gordon, Gordon's typically given um, his pyro field, where he can put his pyro field, then we need to decide from the audience's perspective where we want to do our, our flying. And if a lot of times the, the pyro, it has to be quite a ways away from our airplane. So we need to adjust for that. And that's all a part of the, the give and take between the pyro and the pilots and everything else. And then Gordon will go out there and he'll actually do a, Gordon does a, an outstanding job of making an FAA required briefing from the pyro side at every, uh, at every air show. And, and that has to contain all the elements of how much dynamite's out there, how many gallons of gas, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the key is, and I think uh, Mike made a point of this, every show is a little bit different, you know, to some degree, um, how the audience perceives uh, angle wise where the, 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 the pyro goes off in relationship to the uh, airplanes. We put a, a great deal of trust in the pyro people because they've got a very safety conscious job and they do an excellent job. I can't say enough for, about, about that. Well, the last third of the act is the narration. Why is the announcer so critical to this act? Well, um, so Craig mentioned it when we talked about the three parts earlier, airplanes, pyro, and narration. Without a narrator, just a bunch of smoke and fire. So he's telling the story of December 7th, 1941. He is honoring the veterans. He, he's talking about all the ships that were at Pearl Harbor and I say in every TV interview I ever do, I say, I don't know how much of this they're teaching in schools so kids can come to air show and they can learn about history. So the narration, he takes the audience back. He says, close your eyes for a moment. Pretend it's December 7th, 1941. You're at Pearl Harbor. There'll be some Hawaiian music playing and everybody can really bring themselves into being relate to relate to that and then here come the airplanes and they may or may not be expecting pyro but when that starts happening all of a sudden there's airplanes there's smoke there's fire there's airplanes opposing each other and you got this guy that is telling about the people that lost their lives that day and how it thrust us into world war ii and so I guess you get my point. Without all that being said, it just just wouldn't wouldn't be the same. And so uh, I think about the time we're doing our uh, wall of fire, Kate uh, can't even remember Kate's last name, but <laughs> Kate Smith. Kate Smith's famous. Uh, God bless America, and it's just very patriotic. And like Craig also said, if you think we're glorifying war, you did not, you weren't near a speaker. So it's a very integral part of what's going on. We have to have it. Well, let's talk about that because, you know, that's come up. Are you glorifying war? And obviously you guys have explained how much fun you have doing this. It's a lot of work, but it's a labor of love. You're with family. But why do you really? put this show on it's a it's a living history lesson people i mean people in school don't don't know about world war ii anymore because of these brave men that lost their lives and all these aircraft are a big reason we aren't speaking japanese and german today everybody in the caf by and tour is very patriotic we love this country and we we, we love our freedom and freedom's not free and so it's like you say we don't glorify war. It's a living history lesson. 
and and a, a lot of people uh, i mean there's tears in people's eyes a lot of the veterans come up afterwards and shake their hand he said thank you and they said thanks for doing it i got chills right now you know we love what we do but it but we have a mission we have a mission to educate and to uh keep people aware and and you, you have to stay vigil you have to stay ready you have to be prepared and uh, to to defend our country and we know today you know freedom still isn't free it's, it's still a an ongoing battle that we all have to uh respect we have to respect the people that that died for our freedom because they did die for us and because we're, we're living a pretty good life right now a great life yes yeah, let, let me add just on this um everything that mike just said is absolutely correct and here's another part we don't get paid for this this actually costs each and every one of us a ton of money to participate it is not that free so to speak i mean it may when we do the practice shows everything it's all out of our pocket this is we don't get, do not get paid for this and that's just how dedicated the entire team is the pyro team the narrator and all the pilots and the mechanics that we everybody that participates in this it is absolutely a labor of love there is no compensation for it other than the satisfaction of saying we're doing our best to keep history alive absolutely and if i could add to what mike and buddy both said um, there's far too much effort required to keep to maintain house uh, and keep these these old airplanes they're all 75 years old ready and and able to do the shows not to mention the time off that we take from our personal lives our jobs a lot of us still are are, are not retired i'm not retired um uh it's a lot of work it's a lot of money it's a lot of personal sacrifice and we did uh reno the reno air races uh some years ago uh, it was the first time my youngest daughter kelly got to see the show and uh came up she was falling like a baby and when she saw she said that i had no idea I didn't realize she thought it was fun and games and it's really not it's a it's a very huge passionate message that every one of us um, buys into or we wouldn't be going through all the the trouble and the time and the effort and the money to do it it's a real honor to do it absolutely well thank you for doing that I know we've got some questions out there and one came in ahead of time. So I'll just go ahead and ask that. I know we're running a little bit late, but I think it's worth getting a couple questions in here. So one of the questions, is there any desire or intention to ever bring the show to the global audience and tour Europe with it? And that's from Alan Oran from the UK. I'll, I'll feel that question. It was back in the eighties uh, and when Charles first took over as lead, they came to us and they wanted to bring all the airplanes to Europe for six to eight weeks. And um, these are all 75 year old airplanes. Well, all the small airplanes, we can actually pull the wings off, put them on an aircraft carrier, but the bombers, the bombers, I mean, these are flying museum pieces. They're worth up to $10 million each. And there was no way we could safely and guarantee that they could fly over to Europe without having a problem. They're, as they said, they're 75 year old airplanes. And th then they, people didn't realize how much it would have cost. And they wanted to take 30 airplanes over there, hang around there for two months. And we're talking back in the eighties, uh, millions of dollars. And they went, wow, we didn't realize that. You know, you got to take spare engines, you got to take uh, people to, to uh, support the airplanes. And it, it's just, it's, uh, it's not feasible. When they did, uh, uh, Pearl Harbor, they took all the airplanes on a barge. They were all small airplanes that could ride the barge over. And that, they had a couple of B-25s. It was the uh, camera ship and all the Torah airplanes and the fighters all rode on this huge barge that was uh, 15 feet above the waterline. And they wrapped, they sealed wrapped each airplane, put it on the uh, barge, took it over, unsealed it, flew it for a month, flew it for almost a month and then resealed it and brought it back home. And, and you know, uh, that just the Torah part of that was, you know, uh, more than a quarter of a million dollars just for that. So there is there is a cost prohibitive in taking, this, taking these airplanes. You take eight airplanes cross country, 
they burn a lot of gas because they're they're military type airplanes and uh it's it's a it's a um, expensive um operation and so it's almost uh, uh impossible to take the act uh, to europe Our so alliance. howard i guess that means you need to jump on an airplane and come see the act here in the states yes all right Leah, to... do we have any other questions We've got lots of questions. I think probably the million dollar question is people want to know, are you guys going to be flying this year at all at any air shows? A lot of shows got canceled. And so a lot of people are just wondering, are, are they going to get to see you this year? Wings over Houston to go. Our next scheduled air show is August 28th and 29th at Dayton, Ohio. And we feel very comfortably that that air show will go on and we figure in September and October that uh, we have probably five five air shows left: Wings Over Houston, and uh, Dayton, and some some other airports close around. But we feel like Dayton will be our next performance. Okay. Um, another question is: These airplanes are expensive to maintain, which Craig brought up. Um, and you seem to be, the aircraft seems to be located at multiple airports across the country. How does maintenance get done on the aircraft? We each are responsible for the maintenance on our airplane. We have many uh, AIs or we have licensed mechanics in the group and we all do work on our airplane and they are scattered from Galveston, Texas, where we're sitting uh, up to Huntsville, including Conroe, Texas, with one out in San Marcos, Texas, and one in Muskogee, Oklahoma. So literally, they're all, Muskogee's the furthest one away, so they're all centrally located, because we go east, west, or north from, from Texas. And so, uh, yeah, all, we have 10 aircraft, and they're all between Muskogee, Oklahoma and Galveston, Texas, with the majority of them being in the Houston area. So that brings up a good point with um, the aircraft not doing a lot of flying this year. Is there a way if people want to help support TORA, if they want to donate to TORA, what can they do? Where can they, they make that happen? Well, they can contact the CAF, the Commemorative Air Force in Dallas, Texas, and uh, say they want to make a contribution to Torah, Torah, Torah. And uh, the folks in Dallas know, know how to distribute those funds so that we uh, can keep these airplanes flying. And we can put a link to that in the email that goes out afterward. Um, a really interesting question. Are there any female pilots? I will add, were there ever any female pilots in the group? There, there, there almost was one. JK, JK West, uh, wife, uh, wanted to be a tour pilot. Uh, and like Patrick said, you know, we, we've had people come in, do the training early on, fly one or two shows and leave. Well, a lot of people think, like we've talked about, what we do is fun and games, and it's not. It's, it's serious business, very serious. And everybody thinks we all have a good time doing it. But like I said earlier, once we strap in, uh, it's all serious. It's all business. And we, we get down in there. We have even the FAA now has a 30 minute bubble. You get you get you have 30 minutes where they're not going to bother you. Get, you get your head on straight. You get in the airplane, you walk around it. You'll see guys going through the patterns with their hands, thinking of it. Uh, when I became tour lead, I have I give everybody a briefing sheet. It's got their name on it. It's got all the patterns on it. And we go through every <clears throat> maneuver we do and at the end of it. I start with Patrick, 111, you got any questions? 112, I go through everybody and we go, okay, we got it. And then, and then we go out and, and uh, we, got our, we get our serious face on, we get, we're, we're ready to go and uh, it's business and we take care of it. Uh, back to the maintenance for just a yeah, minute. Oh, well, it's the woman question. <laughs> well, the, the, okay, the, and the point is the, and- <laughs> And I have something to add. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> once, once the only lady pilot who really wanted to do it, found out what it took to do it, because you have to help with the maintenance, with the cost and everything. She did not want to do it. But I still believe one day there will be a female tour pilot. But no, to answer your question, in the 49 years and coming up on 50, there hasn't been. But I believe one day there will be. 
We have a lot There's of an opportunity po- coming up. <laughs> there, oh, excuse me. There is a lot of female pilots in the CAF. Just we don't have any in tour. So. Well, there you go. That's an invitation. Um, so I have a question, and I'm just guessing this came from someone who either is part of the pyro team or knows somebody. How did you all get so lucky to have such an amazing pyro team? <laughs> so <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> it was a leading question. But um, I think another thing to mention might be how many people does it take to put a show together? How many people on the ground in the air? How, does, how many people does it really take? 10 to 15 people in the pyro field. Unless you're setting a world record like they did in Yuma, Arizona, that took about 25 people, but that wall of fire was over three miles long. But on a standard show, 10 to 15 people in the pyro field, one narrator and eight pilots. And that's that's how many people it takes to put on our 22 minute demonstration. Um, Another question came in, have you ever flown the original CAF Zero in any of your shows or are they only replicas used? So the CAF does have an authentic Zero based in Southern California. Has it ever been part of the show? If we ever let a real Zero fly with us, they'll just make us look fake. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, it just wouldn't matter. Something's going to be different that people aren't going to be able to figure out. And all our airplanes have the same performance level. So, uh, no, I, I can't see that ever happening. Never say never, but. Okay, a history question. Um, maybe Buddy can answer this one. What happened to the B 17s that were flying to Pearl Harbor during the attack on Pearl Harbor? Most of them got down safely and intact. Um, Two or three of them were damaged upon landing. And I think one was a total loss, but there were no loss of life amongst any of those airplanes. And yet they arrived unarmed and basically out of gas. But uh, crazy enough, those tough old airplanes, I guess they took some punishment, but brought everybody home on that deal. So another Another question is, do you have voice communications with the pyro team? Do the pilots have communications with the pyro team um, and any kind of reenactors or military vehicles on the ground during the show? Our lead is in constant communication with with pyro lead. Uh, All the rest of the guys, they will speak if there's an emergency problem, but uh, we come in and one of of the preempted calls is, uh, announcer's ready, yep. He talks back to me, um, Pyro, you ready? Pyro's ready. And then, you know, Pyro calls it off. And then uh, and then we come in and talking about the wall of fire, which is after the show, everybody thinks here comes eight airplanes. They look like a beautiful formation. And then Gordon sets off a thousand feet of dynamite and it scares the heck out of most people. They have no idea it's coming. Everybody loves it. So yes, everybody's on the air boss. <laughs> So one question is, how many second generation pilots in Pyro do you have in Tora? And are, are there any third generation families um, that have been Tora members? There's three second generation pilots. Uh, me, my father, Charles Hutchins, Tora lead for longer than anybody ever had it. Uh, Dan Reedy is number two as far as us two young guys and uh, (laughs) his dad led the very first air show demonstration in Galveston, Texas, 1972. And then Mike Burke sitting here by my side as his father was involved in the beginning as well. When we talk about second generation pyro, uh, they're the guy that led it for years, Bob West, uh, known in the industry as No Nick, all three of his kids are involved. And so I really can't think of any other second generation beside those three kids. Yeah. Um, uh, Margaret's Margaret's son is now participating oh. as well. There you go. Yep. Yeah. Mark. 
And ironically, um, Amelia, she's still a little kid. She's probably what, eight or nine now. I'd, I'd be willing to bet money that Amelia will be in a pyro field at some point. That would be the first third generation pyro that I can think of, unless I'm missing something, buddy. What do you think? No, that's about the ones I could think of off the top of my head, too. Yeah. That's pretty cool, really. The West folks are really neat. So another question about the narration. Does the narration mention the Japanese debate about staging a third wave attack? No, not in the narration. It's not brought up. Okay, and then um, one of the final questions. Um, are those tour patches you guys are wearing on your flight jackets, are they available for sale? <laughs> no, those, those are just for the pilots and crew. Right, so you've got you've to put in the time <laughs> to get the patches. Um, those, those are all the questions we've had today, and, um, but we had lots of really great questions, and I, I noticed a lot, of, um, you know, a lot of family members of yours on tour, family members of yours that are on the call today. So if you wanted to say you know, to all of them, to all of you guys, who do such a wonderful job on the field, in the air, even the guys managing the website and Facebook page, you guys do an outstanding job. So thank you very much. Yeah, and I would like to thank our expert panelists, Mike, Buddy, Patrick, and Craig. It's been a pleasure today. Thank you so much for all the time you've put in on this presentation, and thank you for what you're doing to honor our veterans and remind us of the most important lessons we need to know. I hope you guys will join us next Wednesday, May the 27th at 2 p.m. Central Daylight Time to learn about the behind the scenes stories from filmmakers Kara and Adam White who created the new CAF Rise Above Wasp film. Thank you gentlemen very much. Have a great day. You're right, thanks. Thank you.